while there in the wind of being great. Um, no sore heads. It's lovely to see all of you. Um, and if this is your first time here, you're more than welcome. We're delighted to see you. Boys and girls, it is lovely to see you as well. Um, just one announcement this week I have, and it is that there is a prayer time this Wednesday night at 8 o'clock through to 9 o'clock. Um, that's the only announcement that I have. If anybody else is anything urgent, you can wave at me. There is. That's good. Right, well listen, I want to just read one wee verse in the Bible. It's Psalm 147 says this, Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praise to our God, and how pleasant and fitting to praise Him. And that's what we're going to do in, in our, our first time of praise today. We're going to sing praise to God, which is entitled, Our God is a Good Big God. There's, and we've got actions, and people are actually able to do the actions. I've got dyslexia for reading, but I've realised it also stretches the actions as well. We've got a total dysfunction in that, so we're glad that they're here. So we're going to stand, everybody stand together, and we're going to sing, Our God is a Good Big God.
you know what's ahead of us when we don't, you know, when we're going to need these, these truths that we've learned by the Lord, and we know when we need it in our lives, and we know that for each child, we know what they're going into, we know that for the leaders as well, Lord. Thank you for what we've learned as well, it's not just the kids who learn, the leaders who get involved, we love learning about more about you as well, Lord. And I guess thank you for me that. It was so fun. It was really good fun just being here, being together, learning about you, getting to know the kids, and just having a great time. So I thank you that your hand is completely over this one. And that you are um, you are so here and you're just blessing every moment of it. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And the Public Presbyterian Church has Shirley Lennon uh, carrying out different interviews. Sometimes there's people who come around church and, and, and you see their face and you think, well, do they know that person? Um, here's your opportunity. So, Judith and Shirley, go ahead. <laughs> Um, the, the leaders in Holiday Bible Club during the week we usually interview some of them so that the children get to realise that the faith of these people is real and that they actually have lives outside um, Holiday Bible Club. It's a bit like teachers, children in school don't think they you know, really exist outside the classroom. So um, I always think it's a really great impact when the young people on the team share um, some of their story. So Judith, um, first of all, can you tell me why do you want to help out at Holiday Bible Club? Um, well, I love working with children. I have worked with children um, in, with various backgrounds, um, including like, working with the Roman community. I've been in Kosovo with children's Bible clubs and the traveling community. And I just enjoy working with children. Um, this would be, I'm coming up and haven't done about 30 Bible clubs, but not for the reason of just doing a club, but it's for the reason of being able to share the love of Jesus with children. And I just love it. I love being involved, whether I'm a member or organizer or whatever. It's just such a great opportunity to get alongside the children and the families and really be able to share about the love of Jesus. So the opportunity to be able to be part of this team was just, I just love the chance to really just be able to tell you all how much Jesus loves you. Thanks, Judith. It has been really great to have you um, along helping at Holiday Bible Club. Now, this year's Holiday Bible Club was really all about following Jesus. Can you tell us a time when you chose to follow Jesus? Yeah, I was very privileged and I was brought up in a home where both mum and dad were Christians and followed Jesus. They took me along to church and Sunday school, DB, um, CE, um, but I was a wee bit stubborn as a child so I wasn't going to be talked into anything. Um, and at the age of 11 I actually was knocked down by a car. And my P7 teacher said to me at the time, he was a lovely man, and he kept going, you know, you could have been killed. And that played on my head for a wee while, but again I still didn't react. And about a year later, um, my dad was involved in a church plant, setting up a church local to us. And I was listening to someone tell their story of why they had come to know Jesus. And that night, I went home and asked more questions. I'm a, a lot, I like to ask a lot of questions, ask more questions of dad. And it was that night that I decided that I really wanted to say sorry to God for what I had done. And to try and turn my life around, or to turn my life around. And, and although it's a struggle, to turn and choose to follow him. Um, and give my life to him. It's not always easy, but it's something that I aim to do, and I know he's always with me every 
day. Thanks, Jennifer. Really glad you did. Uh, and we can see God at work in your life, you know. Uh, did you have a favourite lesson this week? Um, you know, uh, uh, what was that? Um, yeah, I, well, all the lessons obviously were very good, but I think Thursday particularly struck me. Um, we, we looked at Jesus walking on water, and he walked out. Um, he walked on water, and Peter looked at him. Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on water towards him. But when Peter stopped looking to Jesus, that's when he began to sing. And I thought it was such a good reminder, both to me personally and to the children and leaders, that we need to keep focused on Jesus, our life. If we focus on Jesus, and like the Olympians, which was our theme this week, when you look at a runner and they focus at the end of the line, they fix their gaze and they keep focusing, they don't get distracted. It changes how we live our life. If we keep focusing, do what he wants us to do, and try to live his way, it makes all the difference. And as we, as leaders, were working with the children, we kept pointing them to Jesus, and it was just it was just such a good reminder, and reminded as well in our memory verse later, to fix our eyes on Jesus. Thanks very much, Jim. Good if we always knew there was something in the car crash then. Yeah, if that clears up a lot. Um, now, um, can you just think there, fix your eyes on Jesus? We've been learning a verse in the Bible, really good thing we try to do with children and with adults. And now, so the girls are going to come, um, Hannah, Lisa, and, and Judith, and going to try and teach it to us. Children already know it, so I, I really can teach it to you. I've been struggling to get the verse with this week, so uh, I can learn a thing or two. Yeah. Okay, so the, word, the verse that we have been focusing on this week is on the screen. Um, and the strength of endurance, the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So we were so impressed and proud of the children. So many of them have memorized this verse. And um, we're going to go through it together and hopefully it will stick in your minds after today as well. So, can I have some volunteers, boys and girls? We need nine people to come and hold the cards for us, please. Ian, the evening. Just come up if you would like to come. I'm sure there's probably one or two people who are going to be from the Bible, we always begin by saying the Bible says, and this is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. So we'll say it all together for um, a couple of times. Okay, are we ready? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion Okay, now we're going to try it in a really high squeaky voice. Okay, we're going to have a bit of fun with it. So let's hear your squeakiest, highest pitch voice. Are we ready? And let us run with endurance. The greatest song has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Okay, now Judith's going to take a few words away. The Bible, Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. 
We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith.
have still have a caravan, but there's another caravan I had for going on holidays. And it used to keep it in New Nards, that's where I, I brought it off the guy in New Nards. I had to take it to get new tires on the caravan. And when I took it in, it was a place in Bangor, I'm not name it. Um, I, w- I went in to get the, the tires in the caravan, and the guy must have had a slack day, because he was pulling all the racks out from the shelves, and all the other tires were all out. And I was driving this Land Rover thing at the time, and I said, I don't know, these, these tires I've been looking for for ages. And I said, you wouldn't stick those on as well, would you? So that was great. So, Cars for the caravan, cars for the, 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 the Land Rover as well. Um, price that we nearly need to remortgage the house, but I was happy. And I came in to pay the guy and I went in to the back and he had the till here, and beside the till was a little pile of books. And, and the book, one of the books had a man with a, a curly moustache, and the other man behind him had like five arms up in the thing. And I said, yeah, What's the books about? And he says, If you read that book, it will change your life. He said, I've already found a book that's changed my life. And he said, oh, he says, yeah, Christian. I said, yeah, I am. And he says, well, listen, he says, you only know part of the story. He says, Jesus was a yogi. I have only ever heard of yogi bear. It's the first time I've ever heard of this. He says, Jesus was a yogi. And he says, he was just a great teacher amongst many other teachers. And if you can get the, the, the grips with all the other teachers, you'll reach this nirvana state in your mind. You'll really be with it. And you'll have real truth. So I started to explain why Jesus was different than any other yogi in a logical, calm, peaceful way. And the guy lost his head. He got really mad and threw me out of the shop. I thought he was joking actually when he started. He said to me, get out. I thought, yeah, I was having a laugh, but actually he was throwing me out of the shop. My only regret that day was that I didn't start the conversation before I had head to the tires. <laughs> I didn't have to throw them out afterwards and then have to take them all. But this week what we had was we had stories from Jesus. C.S. Lewis said, if Jesus was just another teacher, then he said he was either a madman, Jesus is either a madman, or else he's the son of God. There's no one between them. Because he claimed to be God. And if you're, normal, if you're just a, an ordinary person going around claiming to be God, you are mad. But let me tell you, some of the stories we were looking at this week, the very first one here, we were looking at these guys who were called by God. You've got somebody walking down the street past the little fishermen. Now, I, I, I've just come from church in our class. You have boats full of Ghanaians and other different fellows out there who are working as fishermen, Filipinos. Now, can you imagine walking up to those people and Jesus walks up, he doesn't know them, and he says, I want you to follow me. Leave your business, leave your families, and come and do everything that I say. Right, here's a challenge. Right, if you don't think that's strange, ladies, I'm asking you if you're out in town this week, go to a hairdresser's that is not your own. Open the door and say to everybody in the hairdressers, I want you to leave your business, I want you to come, and I want you to follow me. Do everything that I say. And gentlemen, I have a challenge for you. Go to the nearest building site. Say to the brickies, the carpenters, and everybody else, leave your coons, lads. Leave your wives. Come on down. Follow me. I would like to see your success rate. And yet Jesus goes to Peter and Andrew and he says, follow me, they leave everything. He goes on down the road to James and John and he speaks to them and he says, follow me. And they leave absolutely everything and they come out and they follow Jesus. Well, this story here, Jesus is doing the feeding of the fact. He's just fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And, and, and everybody's amazed by that. The disciples are amazed. And Jesus says to the disciples, get in the boat and go over to the other side of the lake and I'll join you later on. And the guys all get in the boat and they sail out. Some of them are sailors. They've been out there. They go out at night time. And during the middle of the night, the wind starts to blow. And they have to start blowing. Take the sails down and they blow and they blow and they blow until just before dawn when they see somebody down there and across the top of the water. And I don't care who you are, you've never seen that before. Walking across the top of the water, it's not a magic trick, there's no perspex underneath, there's nothing else, he's down there near the water, and these men are left squealing like sort of schoolgirls at a One Direction concert. They're all in the boat, shouting and roaring, squealing, because they think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, listen, take courage, lads, don't be afraid. He says, it's me. And Peter says, well, if it is you, let me follow you. Let me come out onto the water and go with you. And so he climbs out of the boat and comes toward Jesus. And he can walk on the water whilst he has his eyes fixed on Jesus. 
Once he takes his eyes off Jesus, he starts to sink and embarrassingly in front of his mates, has to be rescued and gets into the boat. Would you say that there's something slightly different about Jesus? He's not just another teacher. He's not just somebody claiming he is somebody who does fantastic things and somebody who is worthy for us to listen to. We'll pick up the other three stories in a wee minute. But, um, Miss Paxman's back and she's going to be talking with Darren. Darren's recently engaged there, so you can... I don't know, maybe I can tell us about that. And how his wedding plans are going. <laughs> Darren was in the sketch in the sketch with me this week and he was my trainer, he was trying to get me training. But the, the worst bit of the animal was I had to pretend to fancy Darren. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so a um, little bit of background for me. I didn't grow up in a Christian family. Um, I grew up down the road, Stratford Avenue, and none of my family members are Christians. So going through primary school, going through high school, I always thought, you know what, it's just about me, it's about what I do. And my education was important, being popular was important getting a good career at high school and so throughout school I was very much focused on my studies and I wanted to always achieve the best and go on and have the best career or be the most popular and about upper sixth um, I got into a new friendship group just because of how you change subjects and in my friendship group were Christians and beforehand I didn't really have any Christian friends but they were able to question me and ask, do I believe in God? And I very much said no. And they didn't really pressure me into it, but they kept asking questions and that put the thought in my mind. Then, sort of fast forward, I finished high school and actually went to Hong Kong for university. So I thought this is great. I made a, got decent grades. I'm able to go to university in Hong Kong. It's a little bit different than going to be successful in Hong Kong and you know have a great life out there but when I was over there I didn't settle in I didn't like it at all and don't get me wrong I was doing pretty okay in my studies and I was getting by but it just didn't satisfy what I thought it would be and I knew that something was different I knew that if I kept going down this road at some point, it's just not going to work out, even if I get a great job, a great house, have everything I wanted. And so I made the decision to leave Hong Kong. I thought, that's not the place for me. And I came back home. I was going to start university in September. I came back in March. And I thought, what is it that needs to change in my life in order for me to be happy? And I was thinking back to some of my friends that I made number six and they were at Queens and they were doing great and loving life and I thought, you know what, maybe it's following Jesus, that's who I need in my life in order to satisfy that hole that was missing. And so in March I decided I'm going to give church a go and see what it is they do there, what it is they teach and I remember parking up just outside, I'm walking up those daunting steps by myself, thinking, I have no idea what's going to go on here. But I walked in and I actually saw Matthew, Charlie's son, who I knew from school. And so I thought, great, there's someone I can go sit beside and at least talk to. And that day that I walked in church was one of the best decisions I've made in my life. I wouldn't say that day I decided to follow Jesus, but it was certainly the start of my journey. And on that day, I thought, you know, this is where I belong. I heard Owen preach, and I thought, this is the truth. This is exactly what I needed to hear. 
And everyone was just so welcoming and they thought, you know, this is where I need to be. And surely, I don't know if you remember, but on that first day, you actually invited me to lunch the following week. And she was like, come back to church and you can come to our house for lunch afterwards. And surely that was such a big part of me coming back because as a Christian, we want to be welcoming people in the church and we want people to hear the word of God. And Shirley and her family were just so welcoming in that, but it was certainly the start of Jesus calling me into faith for him. Thanks, Darren. It's so good that you made that decision that Jesus called you. And it's been brilliant. We all know, all the team members know that you're Hazel's favourites. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Shirley, actually, I, I didn't have enough holidays this year, so what I did was I agreed with work that I could take a little bit of time out in the morning, and then I actually had to go back to work afterwards. <laughs> but what makes me take time out of my work and I guess out of my holidays as well is that as a Christian, we're called to go and make disciples of all nations, and this is one way that we can serve. And so there is that aspect of being a Christian, we want to serve and we want to preach the gospel and share the good news. One way that we can do that is through Holiday Bible Club. Now, for me, as I said, I didn't grow up in a Christian family and when I was, I guess, the age of all of these kids, I didn't have the word of God come into my life. It was briefly in school, but I didn't really pay attention, and then it wasn't in my home. So, looking back on my journey, I would love to be able to share the Word of God with children so that they could know Jesus from an early age and that they could walk with Him from the ages of P1 through P7 so that they don't have to wait until they're teenagers because. I'm sure everyone knows it's hard enough growing up with this, going through primary school, going through high school, and going through that journey without God, I think, is extremely difficult. So to be able to preach the gospel to children and to bring them to Jesus, I think, is just an amazing way to serve. And even if we see one kid come to faith, it makes it all worth it. So being able to take a couple of hours out in the morning and work in the evening, absolutely. Now Alex is going to come now and he's going to read to us a, a, a passage of scripture from Mark's Gospel, chapter six. Thanks for agreeing to do that, Alex.
failed to mention was that there's a quiz on the story that I'm telling you from the Bible. So it's good that you listen. So we've seen that Jesus is a, a, a different than normal people. He talks to people who are doing their job. They leave everything and follow him, which isn't normal. We saw that Jesus walked on top of water, and which isn't normal and gives somebody else the power to be able to do that. But then we see Jesus heading up on the mountain and he takes with him Peter, James and John and suddenly he is transformed into this just shining glory of God. The Bible says his clothes were whiter than anybody could bleach them, shining out this glory. And he's joined by two people who were the greatest Old Testament prophets, Elijah and Moses. And, and they're talking away on the mountain and Peter, James and John are on their faces, overwhelmed by what's happening. And Peter then after it happens... Um, God speaks from the middle of it. He says, this is my son. I, I said, listen to him. And then uh, Peter doesn't know what to say. He says, let's build three tents for you all. He's overcome by, by what's going on. But I don't know anybody who ever goes along and something just bursts into complete light that nobody can look at. Shining brighter, the glory of God shining out of them. Now, the next person he met was this guy. A fellow called Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus was blind from birth. He'd never seen daylight. If you can imagine how the darkness he lived in, he didn't have a job. There's no pips, no DLA in Israel at the time. He's not able to do anything. The only thing that he can do is beg. His friend or somebody else takes him to the side of the road and he sits at the side of the road begging from the pilgrims, heading up to Jerusalem for Passover. And he's heard some, that somebody's coming along that day who could heal him. Somebody who raised the dead. Somebody who's made blind people see. Somebody who's made lame people walk. And this is his one chance to be well. Can you imagine how desperate that man is? All of his life, living in darkness, no hope of a normal life, no hope of seeing anything, to die in darkness, no way to earn a living, not knowing your family, not being able to go anywhere, not being able to do anything, and you've got one chance, one in a billion chance, that this man that you need to see is actually going to walk past you. Of all the places he could be on earth, he's going to walk past you. Can you imagine how desperate he is? As he starts to shout out, he waits all day and he thinks, well, how am I going to get this? I'm just going to have to roar. As soon as I know that Jesus is somewhere near, I'm going to start to shout. And he did that. He waited until he heard the noise getting louder and louder. And then he starts to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, he knew he couldn't ask Jesus to give him justice. He couldn't demand anything because he, Jesus doesn't know him nothing. Jesus just say, I don't know you. Anything. He says, I want mercy. Your help that I don't deserve, mercy. And he recognizes that he's God. And as he's walking past, he shouts again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on him. Remember how desperate he is. Can you imagine how loud he's shouting? Because if Jesus passes, he's missed his chance. He'll be blind forever and die blind. So he shouts at the top of his voice. And everybody around him says, look at the state of that. That fellow's making an absolute show of himself. Will you shut up? Stay quiet. And he shouts all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And eventually Jesus stops, he hears him, and he turns around and he says, tell that fellow to come over. And you can imagine the state that he's in because the boys say to him, cheer up, mate. That's exactly what they say to him. Cheer up, mate. He wants to speak to you. And he leaves his clothes behind, the cloak and all that he has. He goes over to Jesus and he asks, because Jesus asks this question, he says, what is it you want me to do for you? He says, Jesus, have mercy on me, he said. I want to see. Give me what I don't deserve. Change my life. Help me to see. Bring light into my life. Transform me. And do you know, boys and girls, moms and dads, when we come to Jesus in the same way, that's exactly what we ask. Jesus, we can't demand anything from him. He doesn't know us anything. Say, Jesus, will you have mercy on me? Will you forgive my sin? Will you change my life? Help me to see you. Help me to see what it is to live my life for you. And when we come to Jesus like that, he does exactly what we ask. He transforms our life and he changes it. Bartimaeus immediately started to follow after Jesus, which led us to this final picture. A picture of a field and seed being sown in that seed. Every single person here, by the way, you're a field. You're dirt. All right? And you'll return to dirt. Um, but everybody's seed. Everybody's, everybody's the field. And the message of the gospel goes out to all of you. Jesus can transform your life and change your destiny. And you are in one of these here little pictures. You're one of four areas. Every boy and girl here, every mom and dad, every granny, granddad is in one of those four pictures. There's a path and it's 
Hard as your boot. The message goes out and says this, and Jesus wants to transform your life, wants to change you, wants to give you a different future, and you couldn't care less. And it just bounces off, and the birds come down, and they eat it, and it goes away, and you're unchanged. There's next, there's a shallow soil, and they say, well, listen, I, yeah, I really fancy that I change that Jesus brings about. I, I, I would pretty much like that. I'll sign up, but then what happens is somebody comes along and says, you know those Bible bashers down there? I see you're going to church. <laughs> Look at the stadium, reading the Bible. Oh no, that's not me, mate. That's not me. They wilt away and they die because somebody has made fun or looks down at you because of your faith. Then there's the next one that goes in there of seeing a field of weeds. And what happens is they sign up and say, I want to be a Christian, I love to follow Jesus. And then the next thing, work's really busy, school's really busy, we're going to football, we're going to clubs, we're going to this, we're out of that, we're out of the other. I really don't have time for Jesus. And the worries of this life come up and they choke that Christianity to death. And then there's one final seed. The seed falls into the good soil. And it comes up and goes up and you say to yourself, I want this more than anything. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want him to have mercy on me. I want to follow him. I want to change. And you go forward and you produce a fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, hope. All of those things start to spring up in your life because you're following Jesus and he's the one that you want to put first. And it's our prayer that you would be in that category of people and feel open to God, wanting him to change you, transform you, and wanting to produce fruit in your life. Now, I really, really hope that you are listening. Because... Where are you? You're coming to do a quiz. Okay. Tell us and explain to us what it is. What do you have to do? There you go. Give us an explanation. I have a question. I have a question. The entire is holding the prop. So we've got down here Bale and the Greens in Hillhips. And Owen's going to split the church in two. It's probably this side versus that side of team one and team two. The case you can choose what team you want to be on, so you can go on that side, be on team one or team two. And then Owen's going to ask each team a question. And whoever answers, who wants to answer the question, we get it right. You can come up, stand here beside this cone on the floor. And there's two bean bags. And what you're going to do is throw the bean bag through the hip. Serious bit of competition this morning now, and right, girls, you're happy enough being on this side, are you? Anybody else want to go to that side? They look pretty smart. <laughs> so, uh, they, yes, uh, so let's hear it for this side. Woo! Let's hear it for this side. Super job. Like, first question. Who wants to go first? Jesus said, uh, yeah, this side, okay? <laughs> What was wrong with the man who was called Bartimaeus? What was his problem? What was wrong with Bartimaeus? He was blind. Well done, super. Away you go. Take their big bags up. Let's see what the score is. Somebody take a score. Kids doing it. Right, let's see. Neil Kwan. Neil Kwan. Yeah. One more go. Come on, Scarlet. One more go. Come on, Scarlet. Get the face off. Started to 
shine with glory. He met with two people. Who did he meet with? Difficult thing. The best of the Old Testament prophets. <laughs> you could have it quite right. Moses was one of them. And Elijah, well done. Moses and Elijah. Super Joel came, well done. You got up there. There we are. We're little big points this time. Two hundred. When Jesus called Peter and Andrew to follow him, what was their job? What were they working at? They were working at something. What did they work at? They were fishermen. Well done. Off you go. Oh, better stop wiggling that about. Two hundred. No. Mr. Four hundred. <laughs> Very good. Now, here's the question. This side here. Is it normal to follow a stranger who tells you to follow them? No, it's not. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. We're talking about that trick. If somebody comes up and says, listen, come on, follow me. Here we go. But then it's really strange. Would you really like them? Good job. Let's see you in a Oh, 10. 210. Well done. side here. When the disciples were in the boat, no one against the strong wind, how did Jesus get out of the world of the world? How did Jesus get out of the world of the world? Yes. He walked in the water to get into your job and done. Now, go for two. Jesus, what do they show us about the difference between Jesus and us? What's the difference between Jesus and normal people? He is perfect and he is who? He is God's son, he's God himself. Super, well done. What do they say? 
You don't say sin, no, you don't say that's what you say. No, you don't say follow me either. No, what's right? No, you don't say okay. Hard path, the seed doesn't win, the birds come and eat it. Now, if I don't get an answer this, in the next two minutes, I'm, I'm going to throw this over. It's going to be a Passover question. Look at me, no, that's not what it says either. <laughs> they don't listen. Well done. <laughs> they don't listen, they just say, well, listen, that's not really for me, uh, you know, and they forget all about it. Now, sorry, what's happening? Oh. Outside. That was underneath. One more go. Thanks very much for coming.